the Rockies are right over there. Don't just go to the conference. Go and see the Rocky Mountain National Park. Go hiking up at Bear Lake or something. Don't do what I did, which is just to come for the conference. Go and see the area. Good morning, thanks for all, all for showing up. I'm here to talk to you about the absurdity of error handling, specifically thinking about safety critical software. Um, so just for this presentation, I will ask you to keep any questions you have to the end, just to make sure that I get through everything. Um, and with that out of the way, my name is Eric. I work for Codeplay, here's our corporate slide. I'm also part of the Sickle SC working group. Sickle, if you haven't heard of it, is an abstraction layer for running C++ code on accelerators like GPUs. The SC in safety, Sickle SC stands for safety critical. It does not stand for supercomputing, and this is an important distinction. Safety critical refers to any domain where software can cause substantial harm. So for this presentation, this is all the information you need to know about Sickle and Sickle SC. However, if you want to find out more about Sickle, uh, there's another talk later today. Now here's my disclaimer slide. What this says is that the, the opinions in this presentation are mine rather than anyone else's. And here's the outline for this morning. So what I will be doing is uh, defining some terms for you and then presenting a very small case study just so we have something concrete to think about. I will talk a little bit about why this topic of error handling is important and why we're maybe in a situation that isn't quite as good as what we would like it to be. And then I will unpack a little bit about what this means for a safety critical API like Sickle SC, but also what this might mean for you, even if you're not working in a safety critical domain. All right, so first off, I use the word safety in the title of this presentation, and that means that I need to define this. And that's a little bit difficult because everyone uses the word safety, and everyone means something slightly different with that. So to help unpack this, I've invited two experts onto the stage with me. We have the software language designer, whose job it is to design programming languages and libraries. And we've got the functional safety practitioner who writes safety critical software. And the point I'm making with these characters is not that one of them is right and that the other one is wrong, but the, that these two characters come at this topic of safety from very different perspectives. So we can think about what their priorities might be when they're thinking about safety. From a language de design point of view, the interesting topics are things like type safety, memory safety, and more broadly, is the language easy to use correctly and hard to use incorrectly? From a functional safety point of view, though, these language, design language safety features are nice, but what the functional safety practitioners are really interested in is determinism. Does the software do the same thing in the same way every time? And by the same thing and the same way, I mean, does it produce the same result? Does it produce the same result in the same amount of time? Does it use the same memory footprint and all of that? So to dig into this a little bit more, it's helpful to think about abstractions. If you're developing software directly for some hardware, like a CPU, the difficulty with that is that a CPU is easy to use incorrectly and hard to use correctly. If you're developing for a CPU, you're probably using an assembly language, and that's difficult for humans to reason about. And that's because an assembly language requires you to keep track of lots of arcane details all the time. So I've tried to represent this with uh, this unhappy human brain. As an industry, the way we approach this problem is um, we try to layer abstractions between ourselves and the hardware. And well, what the abstractions do is they separate our human brains from the cold, harsh realities of the hardware complexity. So abstractions essentially create an abstract machine that's easier for us to reason about than the underlying hardware. And then what we do is we layer increasing abstractions on top of each other, and that continues to make our brains happier. And here by abstraction, what I mean is really any language feature or a guarantee that the language designer works really hard to produce and put into the language. So if we go back to our panel of experts, we can start thinking about what their primary concerns might be. The software language designer is mostly concerned about what if the abstract machine breaks? The language designer has put a lot of effort into creating language guarantees and language features, 
So the question that it gets asked is, what if something is done that means that these guarantees no longer hold? The functional safety practitioner, on the other hand, is much more concerned about what if the real machine breaks? What if there is real tangible harm in the physical world? So if there is one slide you remember from this presentation, remember this slide. And then we can start to think about what the solutions proposed by these experts are. The language designer might say things like, well, can we put bounds checking on the square brackets operator? Because that improves language safety. The functional safety practitioner looks at that and says, well, what if this bounds checking has unpredictable execution time? What if while my software is checking the bounds on something, my self-driving car crashes into a fire hydrant? The language designer says, undefined behavior is the worst thing ever. And that makes sense because the language designer has put so much effort into creating language guarantees. What undefined behavior does is it destroys all of those guarantees so that they're no longer valid. From a functional safety point of view, though, undefined behavior isn't so bad as long as the software is still deterministic. And the reason for that is that the safety practitioner is much more concerned about the behavior of the entire system. So all the software components and all the hardware components. Even if one of the software components has language undefined behavior, as long as it's deterministic behavior, that behavior can still be analyzed and a safety case can be constructed for it. And finally, the general approach of the language designer is to try to layer abstractions onto a language like C++ to make the language less bug prone and friendly to developers. But the functional safety practitioner looks at that and says, well, but these abstractions have potentially unpredictable worst case execution time. So while these abstractions are executing, perhaps my self-driving car crashes into the aforementioned fire hydrant. So then just to generalize this, from a language design point of view, this idea of abstracting ourselves away from the hardware is generally a good thing. But from a functional safety point of view, this is also a potential liability. So yes, there are, develop there are benefits because abstractions make life easier for developers. The downside is that abstractions create a whole lot of stuff that's hidden from the developer and it's kind of happening under the hood, and that makes it difficult to analyze, and that makes it more difficult to construct safety cases. So to summarize this, language designers are very much focused on language features, and that makes sense, because the language is the domain of the language designer. The langu everything outside the language is out of scope for the language designer. But the functional safety practitioner is much more concerned about the behavior of the entire system, so all the software components and all the hardware components. And as an aside, this helps explain why features like C++ exceptions are so contentious when these two experts are talking to each other. Because from a language design point of view, exceptions interact very nicely with RAII, with object invariants, and with a C++ abstract machine. However, from a functional safety point of view, exceptions have theoretically unbounded execution time, and that makes them a liability. All right, so that's the definitions of safety that we're thinking about. The next term I use in the uh, title of the presentation is error handling, so I also need to define that. And for this pr presentation, I'm going to de define an error as an unintended occurrence. And this is a very arm-wavy definition, but it's good enough for this presentation. It's important to differentiate between an error and the various means you might have for communicating the presence of an error. So you might have an error code or a C++ exception or something like stood unexpected, and these communicate that there is an error that's been detected. And with this definition, we can de then define error handling as the act of returning a software component from an unintended state back into an intended state. And again, it's important to differentiate between error handling and, for example, using exceptions to simply report the presence of an error because if you're using exceptions or error codes to re just report the presence of an error, there might not be any handling logic attached to that. And that's an important use case, but it's out of scope for what I'm talking about today. It's also important to differentiate between error handling and using exceptions or er error codes to communicate information that isn't an error. And that can be an expedient design decision. There's a discussion to be had about that, but that's also out of scope here. <laughs> 
All right, so with, with the definitions out of the way, I'll, I'll present just a very small case study so we can think about something concrete. And here I have everyone's favorite example of taking a vector, dereferencing it, and an, assigning a value to it. And in this example, the vector has a size of three, this index variable has a value of five. And that means that this is an out of bounds right, and this is a very bad thing. Looking at this code, the language designer walks up and says, well, hey, can we add bounds checking to the square brackets operator? This means that the square brackets operator can throw an out of range exception and we can provide the strong exception guarantee. And this line of reasoning gets the gold star for security because an out of bounds right is a, security, is a serious security vulnerability and something needs to be done about it. However, looking at this, the functional safety practitioner walks on the scene and says, uh, this doesn't really help me. So we can think about why this doesn't help this guy. And the reason is that we always tend to focus on this buggy line of code or this problematic line of code, but it's important to remember that this line of code doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists in an application. So this line of code specifically belongs to some function somewhere. That function may belong to a library. Our application might have a separate library somewhere. Our application might make use of static state. Perhaps our application has a worker thread and a third library that maybe wraps a device driver. Somewhere we have a main function, which calls a function, which calls another function. We could have a fourth function. So our application is actually quite complicated and it has lots of components floating around. So then we can think about the lifetime of this vector object that we have. This vector object might begin its life in function two. It could be passed through all of these components and potentially be modified along the way anywhere. At the same time, this index variable we have could begin its lifetime in an entirely different function and also be passed through all of these components and potentially be modified along the way. So what the, what the language designer tends to do is zoom in just on this one line of code and say, this is undefined behavior. I want to remove undefined behavior. The functional safety practitioner, on the other hand, tends to zoom out and look at the entire application in context and say, this whole thing is in, in an inconsistent state. So we have a vector. Our vector has three elements, but for some reason we've gotten into a situation where we think that we can write to the fifth element. This is an inconsistency. The functional safety practitioner has no way of knowing what effect this inconsistency will have on the physical world, or where this inconsistency actually originates, or which of these components are affected. And most importantly, it's not at all clear how all of these com components can be returned to a consistent state so that this apl application can continue to function and continue to function with deterministic behavior. So to summarize this case study, language designers tend to be laser focused on undefined behavior. And again, this makes sense because undefined behavior breaks the guarantees that language designers produce. But functional safety is much more concerned about the behavior of the entire system, so how all of the components in interact both within an application and outside. So then keeping this in mind, we can try to generalize this case study a little bit. We can, and when we think about the term error handling and what that actually implies. What error handling is really telling us is that there are situations that are so unusual that we can reasonably call them er errors. But these situations at the same time are so well defined and predictable and well understood that we can somehow produce a way of application level recovery. Or to put this in pictures, if we're thinking about our application, we have the circle that represents error, error behavior and we can draw a separate circle that represents understood behavior. And if you're going to do error handling, well, you're talking about this tiny bit of overlap between these two circles. And this is where the title of this presentation comes from, the absurdity of error handling. Because it seems to me that in the general case, the set of errorness situations that you can reasonably expect to handle is either entirely empty or nearly empty. And this raises the thorny question of, is error handling actually needed? Is it a thing that we want to do? Is it a thing that makes sense to do? <laughs>
All right, so this all, can all sound very theoretical and abstract, so it's important to ask the question, why is this important? The first part of this question is, why is this important for a safety-critical API like Sickle SC? And part of the reason is that safety-critical systems must be resilient to unanticipated situations. And that, that, that's just a given. The assumption that gets made is that error handling inside an application is one of the ways that this type of resiliency can be provided. And it's this assumption that I think needs to be questioned. Because as I've been looking at examples of error handling that people give, the more you look into them, they either end up in the, in the category of things that are not really an error, or alternatively, things that are not really recoverable. Um, so if you, do, if you have examples of situations that are definitely errors, but are also definitely recoverable, uh, please get in touch me, with me, because I have a very short list, and I would like to add to it. Um, so the Sickle SC is an ongoing effort, and we, we need to define an error handling API that is ap appropriate for it. And the question this raises is, are we designing a feature that everyone thinks that they want, but there is really no way to use it correctly, and no one really even understands it, and it leads to unnecessary complexity. And there, there's, a, there's this attitude that says, well, but it's a safety critical API. Surely you need error handling. And I just want to ask, well, but, but do we? Do we really need it? And then the, the second part of this topic of why is this important is why is this important outside of safety critical contexts? And from what I can tell, the role of error handling is actually similarly unclear just in regular C++, even if you're not working with safety critical things. Because we can ask the same question, what are the situations where your application can reliably recover from an error? And sometimes the impression I get is that error handling, the way we talk about it, it's actually kind of a get out of jail free card. And what I mean by that is, you might be working in a very large application, and you're working on a very tiny corner of it, and you encounter a situation that you just can't deal with in this corner. So what do you do? You throw an exception, that exception goes somewhere else, and you've solved the problem. So what, what error handling is doing is, it's not really referring to an error as such, it's indicating a limitation in the design of the entire application. There's also a certain futility in error handling, because what error handling implies is that on the individual level of the code, so the lines of code, somehow there's been a bug that's been, been introduced. Somehow there's a mistake that introduces some sort of inconsistency. But at the same time, it's assuming that on the level of the application architecture, the application has been architected in such a way that it can recover from, from these errors. And the problem with this is that writing lines of code is hard enough. Creating good architectures is so much more hard. And that means that what error handling is doing is it's really saying that you've made a mistake on the easy stuff, but you trust yourself to get the difficult stuff correctly. And that's quite a tall claim, and that needs to be backed up with evidence. And finally, there's a certain liability to error handling, because it introduces complexity and the value of that complexity is questionable and it needs to be justified. Okay, so that's a lot of doom and gloom. And the next question we need to ask is, is this really so bad? Or put another way, are there situations where error handling makes sense? And in broad terms, I can think of one. I imagine that I have two things and these two are in a happy state. And then one of them goes into a, some sort of inconsistent bad state and then it falls over, and then it's just cleaned up. And then another, another thing is created in its place. So in general arm wavy terms, this way of looking at error handling kind of makes sense. If we can reset one component without affecting other components, that seems to be a reasonable way of thinking about error handling. So the question is, what can components be in this situation? And I imagine they could, for example, be different chips in some bit of hardware you can power cycle one chip while the other one is running, and therefore you can reset its state. Perhaps the components could be different hypervisors running on the same CPU, or maybe they could be different processes on the same operating system. 
Or maybe in an extreme case, they could even be different shared object libraries in an application, where if the shared object goes, out of, goes into a weird state, it can be unloaded and reloaded in a good state. But in general, it seems to me that the things we deal with in C++ on a regular basis, so C++ objects, C++ threads, and so on, within an application, their states are so intertwined that it's very difficult to um, ring fence some of these components to reset them while not affecting other components. And sometimes, if you look at the literature on this, you see terms like application envelope or unit of mitigation used to describe these things. And one thing that I've been wondering is what the, what the purpose of language level ha error handling mechanisms might actually be and whether these mechanisms might not actually be appropriate for error handling. Because one very natural unit of mitigation is an application boundary. And that naturally lines up with a language boundary. So C++ extends to the extent of your application, but no further. So the question of do we need to handle error, to what extent we need to handle errors within an application and within the domain of C++, I, th I think that's an open question. And as, as an aside, whenever you see a presentation on error handling in C++, something like an out of memory error or a bad alloc exception gets called out as a special case. And depending on the speaker, they give different reasons for that, but I'm going to give you my reason. And the reason I think that bad alloc is a special case is because this is one of the few cases where a regular software engineer encounters this idea of a unit of mitigation or an application envelope. Because what an out of memory tells you is that your application is in an entirely consistent state. Your application is fine. Your application can continue executing. The problem is that the, a different component, the operating system, failed to give you the memory you asked for. As long as you can continue working without that memory, you're golden. So then keeping all of this um, information in mind, we can ask, what does, what does this mean for a safety critical API like Sickle SC? Needless to say, this is an active area of discussion. Sickle SC is under active development. One thing we're doing at CodePlay is exploring the ways that a system might encounter errors and how that system could recover and what the role of the Sickle SC API should be in that situation. So I have one perspective on this, but there are definitely other perspectives. I imagine that what the Sickle SC API will end up doing with errors will be influenced by, for example, the Vulkan SC API and other existing safety critical APIs. It will also be impl influenced by industry standards like Misra, by what the upstream Sickle API does, and also what's accepted practice in C++. I imagine that what Sickle SC will eventually end up doing will be evolutionary, not revolutionary. So it's unlikely that Sickle SC will walk onto the scene with something completely new. It will probably be an incremental improvement on what we already have. Also, I imagine that uh, some Sickle SC users will use what Sickle SC provides to good effect, and other, ones, other users will do uh, weird and dodgy things with that. Um, and finally, I imagine that whatever we end up specifying, I will complain about it, and I will say things like, eh, it's not consistent, um, but I'm already starting to make peace with that. Um, so finally, the, the last question I have here is, what does this mean for you, even if you're not working with safety-critical safety software? First off, if you're an application developer, I would say it's very important to be deliberate about what you're doing with errors. So if a library that you're using gives you an error code or a C++ exception, ask yourself, what are you meant to do with that information? Has the library developer told you? Don't assume that it's safe for your application to continue using the library after you get an exception unless the library has explicitly documented error or exception safety guarantees. It's also important to ask if maybe the library is using exceptions or error codes to communicate information that, to you that's actually a warning or some other info. Because that means that your application is not actually on an error path. path. You're still on your happy path and operating normally. It's easy to try to introduce lots of try-catch blocks or if statements into your application in an attempt to handle errors. 
And the problem with this is that this increases your application complexity and your testing complexity, and that has a real effect on cost. And the question that needs to be asked is, asked is, what are the benefits of this complexity to your application? Is this complexity, um, is this extra logic actually helping you fulfill the requirements of your application, or is this, is this all this logic just masking bugs? And in the extreme case, if you encounter an error, could you just, instead of handling, could you just print an error message and exit? Or I would even go as far as saying that if you're doing more than printing an error message and exiting, you need to have a good story explaining why that complexity is justified. Next up, if you're a library developer, when your library throws an error code or exception, ask yourself, what is your, your user meant to do with that information? Are you actually telling them about an error, or are you telling them about information that is not an error? And if it's not really an error, could you communicate this without resorting to an error path? Also, th think to yourself, what assumptions can your user make about the state of your library after you throw an exception? Is your library still usable? And have you documented all of this information? And finally, if you're a C++ language designer, well, first off, I, I'll put my safety engineering hat on and ask, uh, can we have an offline discussion about determinism in C++? Because that's a really interesting topic I want to talk about. Um, but back to this topic of error handling, one of the issues that I see is that C++ exceptions, they're a little bit like a monolithic sledgehammer. And what I mean by that is that in other parts of the language, C++ gives you lots of primitives so that you can construct the thing that you need. But when it comes to error management, there are no error management primitives that could be used to construct a domain-appropriate error management mechanism. You're either stru stuck with exceptions or trying to ma make do without them. It also seems to me that C++ exceptions are quite tightly coupled with object orientation. So that object orientation design approach, C++, works, C++ exceptions work very well with that. But when we, we th in modern C++, we lean quite heavily on things like generic programming and static state and threads and all of this other stuff. And we try to make exceptions work in those cases as well, but they don't line up quite so nicely. And what I'm wondering is whether C++ exceptions are actually getting a little bit long in the tooth and whether we need something else in the language. And finally, one thing that can happen is it can be expedient to use exceptions to communicate information that isn't actually an error. And what that makes me wonder is if the language is in need of ways for enabling different components to talk to each other without resorting to an error path. All right, so this takes me to the end of the material that I have prepared. When I started looking at this topic of error handling in detail, it was coming very much from a safety critical point of view. What does an API like Sickle SC need? And it very quickly turned into one of these topics that superficially makes a lot of sense, but then the more you look at the details, the less sense it makes. There's just, it's just very, really, very difficult to nail down what people are talking about, what the goals are, what you're actually trying to achieve. And then the more I looked at this topic, uh, the more it seemed to me that the issues I was seeing were not just safety critical software issues, they were general C++ software issues. Um, so with that, uh, thinking about whatever software you're working on, whether it's safety critical software or just uh, any other domain that you might be in, I'd like to leave you, leave you with a question. What is error handling meant to accomplish? Um, and this is, the, this is a conversation that I would really like to continue, so please catch me in the hallway, send me an email, but, and also I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. So thank you for your time. Hey, great talk, thank you. Um, at the company where I work, most of our like, uh, client code is written in C++, but we have a lot of server code written in Erlang. And uh, I think one of Erlang's like main philosophies, because it's like this runtime heavy language, is let it crash. Since you have a lot of like distributed processes that if they go wrong, you're just supposed to restart it, similar to how you mentioned. 
And uh, I'm asking if for like something safety critical, like what you work in, do you think it's more reasonable to like adopt this approach of design your whole system such that it's so modular that you can restart failing modules instead of trying to invest a lot of effort into writing application level error recovery logic, which you can get wrong. And like, yeah, that's the question basically. Yeah, very good question. So the question is, does it make sense to just crash and restart stuff? And I think the short answer is yes, especially the types of systems that Sickle SC is targeting. That seems like a much more reasonable approach than trying to do application error handling. If you're on a small microcontroller, maybe you need to do more error handling, especially if you don't have all that uh, infrastructure to restart stuff. Hey, um, I want to mention first that, as you mentioned, if your C++ program is a small part of a bigger application, then it might make sense not to handle the error in C++. But let the bigger application be responsible for that. But I also want to point out, I think that there is a big, um, there's an important middle ground between handling the error and recovering and not handling it, which is dropping into a safe mode. Like if you index into a vector out of bounds in a pacemaker, maybe you just go into 60 beats per minute mode with no logic. And I'm not a doctor, but drop into a safe mode is another way to deal with errors. Uh, yeah, so, so the question is, is there a middle ground where you try to drop your application into a safe mode? And I, I think there definitely is one. The question that then needs to be asked is, how confident are you that your safe mode is reliable? If you've ended up in an inconsistent state in your application, what effort have you put in to ring fence the logic of your application so that in, that inconsistency hasn't also propagated into your safe mode? Okay, um, unfortunately I'm told that the session is over, so I'm happy to take all of your questions offline. Thank you again.